panel discussion link. So the app, the online app for your questions, comments, inclusion, and polls, we have Slido. Um, and sli.do is the link where you need to go. Also, the hashtag that we'll be using for this panel discussion is PLC2. So feel free to put in all of your comments and any questions that you have there. The second panel discussion, the topic that we're going to discuss is Pakistan, a preferred destination for offshore and outsourcing. Um, we have this particular report also included as part of the one page summary that's in your handbook. So feel free to do that. Uh, we'd like to start off calling on the first panel on board. Uh, that's Mr. Asif P, the Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director, Systems Limited. Asif Peer sir, hello. Thank you. Uh, we've started off with the panel discussion. Asif Saab, thank you so much uh, for being here. Mr. Khwaja Tanvir Saleem, the Chief Information Officer, Engro Corporation Limited. Thank you, Tanvir Saab, for being here. We can carry on with the applause. Thank you. Mr. Asim Siddiqui, the Country Managing Partner, EY Ford Roads. Sir, thank you so much for being here. Sayed Irfan Ali, the Executive Director, State Bank of Pakistan. Irfan Saab, thank you for being there. Ms. Hina Sadiq, partner Deloitte. Thank you, Hina, for being here. It's always encouraging to see uh, female participation on the panels. I'm very high for diversity. Thank you so much for taking out the time. Mr. Sajad Mustafa Sayyid, the Chief Executive Officer of Excellence Delivered. Sajad Saab, thank you so much. <laughs> and moderating this esteemed panel, we have Mr. Irfan Farooq Maimon, the Group Head of Audit and Risk Review, United Bank Limited. Thank you. So just to reiterate, uh, for Slido, the hashtag is PLC2. Your questions, comments, and polls will be live, and we'll be sharing the results of the poll for you. Irfan Saab, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to congratulate ACCA for organization, organizing such a great event. Uh, it's been a great turnout. I was part of the previous conversation on CPAC. It was quite insightful. There were uh, lots of takeaways for me, and I'm sure that there would, there must have been lo lots of takeaways for uh, the audience as a whole. Building on that um, momentum, as well as the energetic and interesting conversations we have had earlier in the day, I will continue with the flow. Uh, and before I start off uh, the topic itself. I would like to uh, say thank you very much for this esteemed panel. They have spared their precious time to come over here and share their thoughts with us, which I'm sure would add to more insights for this community and, and the room as a whole. Without wasting any further time and getting straight uh, uh, into the nitty gritties, uh, the topic today is very relevant for us and very current for us. That's something that matters for all the emerging markets like Pakistan. Pakistan have got uh, huge potential. Uh, we have lots of uh, talent, uh, especially in youth. In terms of the numbers, the way we look at it now, uh, most of our population is under 25s. And if I were to look at under 30s, it's around 64% or maybe more than that. So for outsourcing, which is generally driven by youth, it is something that uh, is relevant for Pakistan to shape up their economy and in terms of where and how they want to go, go ahead with it. And, and, and that's why I believe that uh, uh, as a community, as, as, as a nation, this is something we re really need to consider in terms of how we can, we can progress, how we can do more than what we have done. We've been hearing a lot about do mores and do mores, but I think this is where we should be doing more. And uh, with this esteemed panel, we will get into those conversations and ideas in terms of how we can bring that forward. So 
to as an ice breaker um uh, to start of the conversation i will um, because it is an area which captures lots of imagination in terms of how the technology is going ahead now and what's going into that area i thought that would be the most relevant area to start off uh, for for our audience so uh, uh, tanveer who is the uh, cio at angro uh, if you don't mind i'll start off with you by asking um, a very studious question just so that i can um, bring in the audience engage them uh then we you have worked a lot with um, uh, both national and international organizations and uh, uh, based on your own experiences and and especially at your organization as well what do you believe what actually triggers management's decision to outsource when do they actually decide that we should go for outsourcing be it onshore offshore and what do you expect or what do you believe uh, based on your experience is the criteria for selecting an outsourced uh, service provider because being for us as a country i think it is very relevant to know what organizations are thinking both with a view of local as well as international view okay mai shukriya irfan sir thank you very much and assalam alaikum to you all uh, i think as irfan mentioned is one of the very sure. kick off connect question wherein we just discussed okay, what are the things what are the criteria which uh, triggers the outsourcing part within any organization and what are the things which make the management decide okay outsourcing has to be done or not should be done whether we should go for outsourcing or insourcing offshoring or insuring and so on and so forth uh, i think the outsourcing is not a new topic it's been i recall in my one of my former organization where i used to work we did a major outsourcing for the entire invoice to pay process uh, about a decade back and uh, at that times the parameters were different it was more about okay, what type of process maturity exists what type of uh, uh, knowledge silos that we need to resolve what type of uh, commercial value is going to going to make but how about you know if we talk about this particular moment the key area the key element which dictates very strongly on whether we have to go for an outsourcing model or an insourcing model is primarily driven by the i uh, what i say the convergence of the technologies or the entire ecosystem of the technology is not maturing enough and it is matured enough to a stage where the various disruptive technologies are coming together uh, alongside so if we talk about iot if we talk about disruption if we talk about blockchain if we talk about ai all those things will come in place you know to support the entire ecosystem which pushes forward towards the Uh, more of the outsource model and and when you talk about the business decision it comes upon okay, what are the core thing that a business has to do if i work at when i used to work at unilever you know, we used to say okay, we i used to work in a company that makes and sells soaps so if we make and sell soaps then we should be focusing more on more on making and selling soap leaving the expert areas of the it or the development or the uh, uh, even the rudimentary tasks like making the payments or making the purchase orders and stuff like that to be outsourced to an organization which can do it much well now when we talk about outsourcing generally in those 10 10 years back it was more like getting the people out of a room putting them in one place and giving them more access to do one particular task which is for example making the payments now those payments could be made by the banks as well now so the banks can start coming into the pushing into the thing what can be done similarly payroll processing things like payroll processing then the banks comes and say okay not just the hr companies but the banks even come and say we can do the process the payroll for you so and so forth but now when we do all those stuff separately and when we put the things like when you talk about more about i think asaf will talk more about rp and and the ai and the blockchain so we can start building the efficiencies and the effectiveness and the cognitive analysis and the data and the information and the customer let's go so beyond the control that it is much better to get those thing in place in a much more structured way by getting those thing out so which you don't want to be your, your primary um, uh, prime part of your business so generally uh, process maturity yes is one of the area uh, which uh, dictates or pulls in that we should go for the outsourcing of a particular processes similarly the scalability uh, that comes into it but as of now uh, my personal view is 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 actually the ecosystem of the all the technologies are coming in together uh, at the right time and they're coming up with such a strong pace and you know there was time when the 
innovation was the keyword. Now we are living in an era where the disruption is the keyword. And digital transformation is actually the transformation from the innovation into the disruption. So we, we, we love to be disrupted. Uh, and uh, we mean especially the uh, millennials we are talking about. So we have got the, we are blessed to have a nation where we have got a large number of millennials along with that technology. And you know, especially when you talk for innovations also, you know, innovation is, is actually the combination of three major activities. It's, it's more about the technology, it's more about environment, it's more about interconnectivity. Now those three forces are increasing in a very exponential. Just look around the way that technology is changing. In the last session, uh, Zishan mentioned about where is the Kodak nowadays, uh, where is the Nokia nowadays. And if the pace goes on, we don't know where going to the Sony now after a couple of years now. Because the way the Samsung is taking up the Sony part, of, of a media uh, and the stuff, then where, where those things will take place. So keeping those things, and especially you know, this deception, uh, as we go into more of more of a discussion, will press the entire new wave of deception as in a year or two years when, when 5G will land in. It will change the entire landscape again. You know, we have been talking about uh, 1 IR, 2 IR, 3 IR, 4 IR, and now we are talking about the fifth uh, innovation of deception will coming up when, when, the fifth, when 5G will land in. It will change the entire landscape, and, and the things are in place. Like 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 Dubai uh, Expo, uh, they are, they are they're very keen to start off that particular site where they make the Dubai Expo to be fitted with the uh, 5G, the very first 5G in in person. Though there are certain patent issues, we will sort it out within a year or so. But two years down the line, disruption will change further, and this these type of 5G type of things will make the outsourcing thing much more in a different pace. Thank you very much, Tanvi. Thank you. What I picked from uh, what you just explained was a couple of thoughts, and and I build on those thoughts. Where you use the words digital transformation, RPA, big data bank, these are the words that are very synonymous and very common with the banking industry that I come from. There's a lot of talk about digital transformation in terms of what the banks must do. There's a lot of discussion about open banking. There's a lot of discussion about uh, cost efficiencies within the uh, operations of the bank as well as uh, 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 manufacturing and the wider industry. So using those thoughts, my next question for ASEM is in, in terms of RPA itself, uh, ASEM, what, it, it's, it's a buzzword. It's getting a lot of attention. Uh, there's a lot of consultants that you, when you keep talking about with them, the business community wider, everyone is talking about this word. So what actually does that word mean for big four firms like yours? How, where do you believe, how can you position yourself, uh, uh, EY Pakistan, not just regionally, but globally, and, and what can, can you offer on this front, which is getting a lot of attention across the globe? Uh, RPA robotics process automation is, uh, is basically taking out all the repetitive uh, and rule-based uh, work and putting that into a program. So yeah. it's not literally a physical robot, but it's a program that's actually taking data and information from different sources and actually running a process which otherwise you would require uh, humans to do or multiple human beings to do, which may be an inefficient process. Um, and already uh, globally accounting firms, including EY, have been investing in RPAs for their internal work as well. So, you know, if, if you know that uh, audit firms generally send down a whole swathe of people to, to clients doing uh, uh, a lot of work, which, which again is repetitive. It's not something uh, which necessarily is always requiring um, great deal of thought process, it requires you to understand what's being done, but those rules can be defined. So a, a lot of things like uh, getting bank confirmations, reconciliations, uh, uh, sending out uh, confirmation letters, getting all of that information compiled, where you have people spending a lot of time, that can be eliminated. And uh, two years ago, uh, uh, in, in MENA, uh, our firm uh, deployed four bots onto the, with the audit team and within two years the the gross margins were up five percent because the amount of time that was being spent uh, and another four bots i think have been deployed this year so we are looking at uh, these kind of processes to uh, improve the the efficiency you know clients these days with the kind of data and technology that's that you have at your hand expect a much wider coverage you know a sample of 20 out of 150,000 
is something that they are not quite happy with. So what they want to do is they want to be able to do analytics. They want to be able to get a representative sample that is, focuses on risks and, and the outliers. And all of this can, can happen by using data analytics tool and then using uh, you know, process-based technologies to, 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 to complete our work. But that's not all. Yeah. Getting outside of my profession, if you look at any industry where there is a repetitive process, uh, you have a situation where you know a person comes in the morning, uh, has his cup of tea, does a piece of work, sends an email to somebody, yeah. waits for that reply yeah. to come back, then takes his break again, uh, lunch break, prayer break, you know, by the time all of this is done, his productivity is down to maybe 60% at best of, of the time that that person puts in. An RPA pro process uh, yeah. can actually run this 24-7 and, 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 you know, uh, cut down the processing time and increase the volume, yeah. uh, you know, produced, uh, you know, multifold. Yeah. So, you know, these are things that we are trying to introduce. We've got an RPA team based in Islamabad and working with our clients in manufacturing sector, in telecommunication sector, et cetera, and trying to uh, identify, and, and also banking sector where you've got, you know, a lot of processing at the front end connecting uh, with the back end, uh, and trying to set up processes which are rule-based, which are repetitive, which are high volume, and use uh, robotics process automation to, to, you know, get rid of the inefficiencies and, you know, the labor-intensive work, rule-based work, uh, and improve the productivity of organizations. So I think there's a, there's a lot of scope for that. Uh, however, companies have to invest in it. Uh, we're still struggling with companies investing in technology yeah. and in people. So, you know, uh, I, I think people are quite, quite happy to see brick and mortar. I mean, I'll, I'll refurbish my office, but I won't spend on technology. <laughs> you know? uh, so, so those kind of, you know, mindsets have to change because uh, you know, that's, that's what's going to change your decision making and make you more agile and efficient. Yeah. Um, we've seen that wherever, you know, we talked about outsourcing, um, clients will ultimately outsource all their non-core functions, yeah. you know, wherever they see that there is enough capacity that's already built in. Having said that, uh, you can just either outsource whatever it is uh, that, you know, you, you, you do that piece of work for the client and you put in that whole labor force. Or you can use technology to not just make the process more efficient, but also more useful, you know, in yeah. terms of the kind of reports, in terms of, you know, the analytics uh, that you provide to the client yeah. and, and, and give the value add so that they can then just focus on the decision making and the core activity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think huge amount of scope in these areas. That was quite insightful. Uh, Hena, would you like to add something to that, being part of Big Four? Uh, I think uh, uh, Asam had uh, <coughs> put in in uh, a lot of uh, insight, uh, outsourcing and uh, core sourcing also, it actually enables all businesses to concentrate more on their core functions and uh, delegating all these non-core functions to uh, institutions and organizations to whom that becomes, that particular part is their part of their core operations. So it generally increases the efficiencies and the effectiveness of all processes across the board. Yeah. It's generally always a fear that with RPA and all these technologies and those sort of things, uh, it might increase productivity. In fact, it won't, it not might, it would definitely increase productivity, but there's a lot of fear factor. People believe that they would end up losing jobs. Uh, I think that's not true. Uh, artificial intelligence, I think, will never mm -hmm. replace real yeah. intelligence. And at the end of the day, we are the people who are using it. So there will always be a demand for human capital. The only thing would be probably that the skill set would change. People would now have to work on their development of their intellect and their uh, uh, technical skills yeah. rather than just uh, be menial workers, you know, coming in and just doing the work. They'll have to think differently. They'll have to react to situations differently. Uh, loyalty, the concept of loyalty and the concept of belongingness is changing with the changing landscape. Yeah. So a lot of it needs to be reworked and rethought of. Uh, I don't think there'll ever be a human replacement as such, but you would need to rethink your role in the entire process. Uh, I'd just like to add one thing in terms of, you know, there's always a question about <clears throat> jobs elimination. When, you know, when, we, when I started a job, it was more like whenever automation happens, the jobs goes away. Yeah. Uh, jobs do go away depending upon what type of job it is. You, know, you will see very strange jobs around you must have noticed sometimes there are lift operators. 
No, I always felt like, what's the job of left operator? It's just doing nothing. Just pressing the button, going up, going down. It, it seems like, you know, it's, it's a waste of the human potential that we is there we have. So, do you really think that it is a good job for a person to just do nothing, but just keep on pressing a button, goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down? So, those type of jobs, obviously, will, will eliminate. Plus, there are lots of rudimentary tasks. Uh, for example, you know, if data collection, uh, you know, we, we are moving from data collection into data mining. The data mining part could be done by the data scientist. It will be done by the AI experts, why not? It will be done by those things. How many of us must be iPhone users or the Android users? How many of you have actually used a Siri, which is the artificial intelligence tool that we have got in our hands? How many of us use those, uh, go, okay, Google, that we have got each and every hands of the Android users? So we don't use those technologies. So the adoption, what Asim mentioned, it took some time for us that mindset to change and to adopt. But yes, jobs will change. For example, with the advent of Kareem, there are lots of taxi drivers uh, who are not adoptive to the newer technologies on how to read the maps, how to get adoptive to Uber or the Kareem type of the, the way things are being done. They are losing their jobs. They, they, these things will happen, yes, but that human potential has to be adopted, has to be trained, has to be nurtured, has to be hand-holded to the newer levels. That comes with the bigger responsibility and challenges where uh, to address those fear in terms of change management. Uh, yes, that do comes up. So, Jad, you want I'll to just like to, uh, <coughs> sahab, I'll just, sahab, just like to add here that, adding on to what, what you just said, uh, as a regulator and, and as, a bank examin, as a bank examiner, I've observed that with the introduction of technology, there weren't any jobs lost, in fact. And the, the only change, uh, I think that the positive change uh, with the introduction of technology is the enhanced efficiency. And uh, to be able to ar arrive at the, the right figures, for example, 10, 15 years ago, <coughs> we used to ask a very basic question, is the balance sheet that comes before us, is, does it represent the true facts and figures of a particular institution? Now, if, if that, that was a challenge and every time the auditor signed it, he, he had to be sure that it, these are the right figures. But gradually with the, with the introduction of technology, with, with IT audit going on and, and with figures becoming more and more transparent and available, I believe that the books have changed. Yeah. The books have changed positively. Yeah. And if you look at any financial statement now, you can be quite sure of it that it, it has been adequately and appropriately compiled. The only difference you'll find is when humans don't input the right figures, that is where it will go wrong. Otherwise, the technology doesn't affect such things. Yeah, uh, I, I'd like to uh, make two points as uh, uh, one regarding the nature of outsourcing and the other one regarding the jobs. Uh, the nature of outsourcing, ji, historically, my uh, experience is that we textiles in textiles. So we were never very efficient in or uh, we never focused on quality. We almost always focused that look, our labor costs are lower, our input costs are lower. So let's sell our, our product is lower. So let's, we started competing on lower labor costs. When other companies, countries came in like Bangladesh and China where labor was even cheaper, we started losing out to them. In outsourcing, our, I believe that our uh, differentiator should never be that our accountant is cheaper than uh, an accountant in India or an accountant in Philippines or the one in Saudi Arabia and so on and so forth. Our differentiator should be that our accountant is better, our IT person is better. And that is where the debate comes in, right? So, for instance, yesterday I was sitting with, a, with an American CIO of an American company called Zones. They moved initially 200 jobs and now they are moving 500 jobs into Pakistan in Islamabad. They are buying, setting up a huge center in Telenor. And one of the things, and I've been working with them for many, many, uh, for a very long time. And the differentiator we started, he's also a Pakistani and we wanted this, this Pakistan spirit thing. So our differentiator over there, and they moved 300 jobs from India to Pakistan, by the way. So our differentiator over there was not the fact that Pakistanis are cheaper. Our differentiator was they are better. So we picked up the top talent in the technology that we were de dealing with, paying them exceptionally high salaries, much lower than what they would pay in US, but they were actually better. Now, their future strategy is that the project manager will set, sit here and his junior assistant project manager would sit in America. So we actually changed the game. 
So, and, and that is where as, I think as outsourcing companies we need to focus on. For instance, we have about 70 customers sitting in Saudi Arabia, Middle East, where we manage their SAP systems and their Oracle systems and so on and so forth, based out of Pakistan, in Lahore and Karachi. And our differentiator, we started, it, it is a difficult ride, that it's not just the price, it is the value that you give on that price. On the second point, in terms of jobs and outsourcing, I truly believe that with AI and others, a certain segment of jobs will go. You will no longer be driverless cars, you, we will not need drivers. We've seen this problem in the West. The current uh, issues around uh, North America, the Brexit, be it Brexit or be it uh, what's happening in North America, it's because the labor dynamics are changing. It happens with industrialization happened, the same thing happened. You know, when uh, technology came in, the same disruption is happening. It is how the world moves. Uh, every 50 or 100 years, certain jobs do become obsolete. We have to change with the time. These things will happen. It will come to Pakistan. Uh, yesterday, I met with somebody who said that uh, one of our guards, Kiji, my son, who is driving, wants to be a driver. I said, man, he's a young man. Teach him something else. Teach him welding. <laughs> but driving, he, by the time he's 25, I can assure you, he won't have a job. Or by the time he's 30, he won't have a job. So uh, these are the type of things I think uh, we need to be forward thinking. Uh, and that's how technology works. And as a country, I think if we are positioning ourselves as an outsourcing uh, destination, then we need to focus on value and not just, just low labor costs. Thank you very much. Um, Asif, talking about human resources and what Sajjad just mentioned in terms of uh, the pool of talents we've got and the uh, advancement that's happening in the technology. You have been, you are one of the largest uh, IT export companies in Pakistan. Uh, talking of all these buzzwords, blockchain and so many things, artificial intelligence, RPAs and so on and so forth. What has been your success story? Uh, which I'm sure that lo lots of people here would be interested to know. And where do you believe, how do you believe Pakistan can acquire those skill sets um, um, within our youth community so that we can progress as some of our neighboring countries have done, like uh, India has done a lot in uh, IT developments, China, <coughs> manufacturing, Poland, and you take on examples like Philippines. So what, what, what would you um, uh, believe to be the key uh, things that we should be doing and how we can increase our export sales as we go along. So, uh, uh, I think it's a very broad question. Uh, so first, uh, first, I would like to start with the opportunity, right? What is our opportunity here and for Pakistan as well as uh, the global? I would put the global perspective Global IT and IT enabled services is 43% of 4.8 trillion USD. So right now the market size is 4.8 trillion USD, out of which uh, about 115 billion dollars is IT outsourcing, IT or IT enabled services yeah. outsourcing. So what Pakistan gets here, of course, uh, is fraction. We are, if you go by state bank numbers, we are touching one billion dollars, right? And if we compare, I'm, I'm not talking yeah. about India or anything because that's not a fair comparison right now. So just, just talk about like Egypt, right? Which is uh, like half of our population. And it's not like uh, uh, superior in any capability that what we carry as Pakistan and country risks are not different here. They are like at $4 billion right now, right? It's just 4X of what are IT and IT outsourcing services. Again, in Philippines, you just gave an example. Yeah. They are 28 billion USD, IT and IT enabled services outsourcing. So opportunity is huge uh, if we compare. And uh, uh, if you look at uh, facts and figures, Pakistan, as per, not per my research, yeah. but World Economic Forum survey, uh, they have said Pakistan is the most affordable IT outsourcing hub. Is the most, it's a World Economic Forum survey report. And uh, I just built upon what uh, Sajjad just said that it's not about the cost that will or price or labor arbitrage that is going to bring IT outsourcing or IT enable outsourcing business to Pakistan. We, we have to accept as a country what is our perception outside. The US, <laughs> North America itself is like 70% of outsourcing, 70 billion USD happens from North America. 
right? What is our perception there, right? That is the most important element that everyone needs to understand. So we, as a nation, we have the risk, of course, nobody wants, like we have a travel yeah. advisory. Yeah. It's a huge challenge. Uh, if you want to call upon any American, the large customers, if they want to outsource you thousands of bodies, they are not going to come first of, uh, first of all and place that. That's a big Im impediment uh, for outsourcing. Uh, but if you look at the opportunity, we cannot, we have to build our USP. Whoever is outsourcing business, whatever outsourcing, IT or non-IT, you can't just say that uh, that we are doing the same thing which other country is doing. We have to do more, as you just said, because uh, we have our own challenges and we ha when we live in the challenging environment, you, you have to compete based on your skill set. So what, as you asked the question, what we have been doing, we have, alhamdulillah, about, we are serving about 200 plus uh, customers globally, uh, local aside, just global customers that we serve from Pakistan, including North America, Middle East, Europe, and all these uh, developed economies. What we have been doing is we have, we are, we are saying that we are a problem solver. Yeah. We take any problem and give you the solution. That is our strength. Uh, whether it's an ERP, whether it's uh, data, whether it's yeah. uh, RPA, whether it's a blockchain, whatever technology comes into play, uh, we, we are better in providing you the pro solution of your problem and use the technology as an enabler. Because yeah. technology for technology companies is not a challenge to learn any new thing that comes to your horizon. So if you believe in that skill set and if you believe in that USP, you can outsource something. And I'm just just give you like 30 second view on non IT outsourcing as well. Yeah. Like uh, you go to everyone, most of you guys must have traveled to Dubai, right? You look at a lot of Philippines in hotel industry, anywhere, wherever you go, right? There are a lot of Philippines over there. Why? Because we always talk about labor class. We always, whenever our talent is in Dubai or Saudi, we always take about, talk about labor. I think there is a huge opportunity for Pakistan if we can train, as you said, like less than 25% of years of age is 50% population with about 100 million yeah. plus population. So we cannot train everyone in IT, of course, it's difficult, right? But we can train a lot of people in business process outsourcing. Uh, RPA and all of these things will not eliminate these traditional work that needs to be done. Of course, it will be, be things will be more efficient but it won't be eliminated. So we have to train on those skill sets. We are the third largest population for English speaking in the world. That is the fact. It's not, I'm not saying this is a research report. So these contact center, omni-channel contact centers we can establish here. It's building these, we talk about always AI and difficult things. Yeah. These are the low hanging fruits. Uh, training in the hospitality industry. Again, you can take a graduate, he, if he speaks English, he can be in the hotel desk as well True. while the Philippines are there. So once you export that core talent, it's exporting the core talent and they bring the remittance to Pakistan, which we all need. So creating an employment uh, generation in Pakistan uh, for what we do, we develop talent, we produce talent. We are not relying, uh, like I think it's a big excuse that everyone takes uh, that government needs to do A, B, and C things for us to be competitive. Uh, government needs to give us the rebate and do this and that, then we will be competitive. It's, it's absolutely not uh, required. If you believe that, you don't need like uh, hundreds of thousands of people, like you can, uh, so unfortunately in Pakistan, people create a hype that we will train 100,000 yeah. or 10,000 AI people. Where is the demand for 10,000 AI people? <laughs> If you produce even 1,000 good quality AI engineers, their revenue per employee is minimum $5,000. Minimum. Minimum, I'm saying, right? That's right, right? Yeah, so yeah. you can just multiply and do the math, you reach at $500 million, right? Yeah. Export services. So I think just focus on the quality and the USP, what we bring to the table. And all these technologies will produce the employment and uh, we will increase our export uh, for Pakistan. I would say that IT is the only opportunity for this country, for Pakistan, as Zishan was saying, what we all have to do. But IT is the only sector right now that can reduce our um, foreign exchange yeah. uh, difference and it creates a positive balance of uh, payment situation because in IT, we don't import anything. Yeah. Thank you. We generate employment only and setting up an IT company for outsourcing 
doesn't take uh, uh, like too much of a capex or investment. And the revenue per employee is about, I would say, 6x of any textile worker that what we generate in the export. So at least 6x, if uh, I've done that calculation. So you can imagine, like, with less people, you can do a, create a huge impact in the industry and the country. Yeah. So all the focus, we all need to be uh, making sure. And again, and this, this, of course, not a lot of yeah. IT companies here. But what I would like to give a message to a lot of CEOs and CFOs uh, or ACCA people here is that if you guys uh, want to invest, as then Fajat Tamir said that as well, if you don't invest in the technology and you want to be competitive and transparent to the world, it's not going to happen. IT is not a choice right now. The business as, as usual is not good enough anymore. So everyone should not save money on IT services or IT automation, but have to invest more and more to be competitive uh, to the world and should not rely on these rebates and bring efficiency and productivity through those technologies. So that's what uh, my message to all of you. And again, for ACC or CA or whoever accounting students, don't think like that you only will get the job as a CFO or as an assistant finance manager or finance managers. You have a big opportunity in ERP space. Uh, ERP consultants make, I would say, like 5x of what you can make in typical accounting job. If you are good at it, supply chain, finance, all of these things are easy for any accountant, uh, ACC or CAS, ICMA or whatever, right? Uh, qualification you are. So bring your talent out, go to IT industry, and then you will be the enabler in producing and exporting talent to the, for the Pakistan, and you will generate an employment as well. Thank you. Thank you, Asif. I applaud your passion and uh, your insightful analysis. You talked a lot about maths, uh, remittances, and this takes me an opportunity to uh, 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 have a question for uh, Sagid Arfan Ali Saab uh, in terms of street banks um, uh, help with the sector. Uh, Irfan Saab, there's a lot of uh, what we just heard now in terms of remittances and remittances in and out money when it goes in and out. It requires regulatory regime in terms of how do we govern all the sort of things and uh, building uh, from what's the last session from ACC was, which was again very relevant, it was ease of doing business, taking all that into consideration and the challenges that these outsourced models sitting in Pakistan, remitting in and out uh, for um, uh, people abroad. How do you think State Bank can enable this sector? I think this uh, should be the question of the hour, I, I, I would say, if, if not the day. Uh, State Bank of Pakistan, uh, as you, you may be aware, we, we have a setup called the Pakistan Remittance Initiative. And, uh, and that is in existence uh, for almost for the past seven, eight years. And when we began practically working on remittances, we had uh, remittances of about $6 billion per annum. So that, that was the time when we thought that remittances are important for Pakistan. And we should now be getting more and more money of hard-earned Pakistanis money who work uh, all over the world. And yes, uh, we have been selling uh, poverty and, uh, and less qualified individuals who work. But at least the, the learning that, that uh, developed over the years was that it was in fact the people of Pakistan, the laborers who were sending money back to Pakistan. Excuse me, but it was the labor who was sending money back to Pakistan. So we helped, you know, started to work with the labor camps and we found out that bulk of money comes from Saudi Arabia, $5.5 billion, UAE about $3.5 billion. So when we worked on that Pakistan initiative, remedies initiative, we are now getting about Last year, we closed at $20 billion of remittances. And by the way, that's your life and blood that runs your country. And that's why Imran Khan yesterday, he said, please, our workers ko retain kare, hire more and more. Now we got 20, we, we are targeting $23 billion this year, but uh, I, I see it at a, a bit lesser than that, but the remittances are good. Now, 
the most important question is that there is a large group of Pakistanis who operate, operate out of Pakistan and they are called the freelancers. And the freelancers who run into millions, again, make a lot of exports but don't bring their money back to Pakistan. Now, that, that's where the challenge lies. So here we started to work on, on this particular subject about a year ago and uh, we, we decided to you know find out who these freelancers really are and uh, what are their financial needs and how do we get to them. So we engaged uh, with both the private sector banks and uh, the public sector institutions and we found out that uh, Pakistani freelancers, they retain money abroad because it's too expensive to bring it back to Pakistan. So the first step that we took was that uh, we, uh, we engaged with a few banks and we issued a circular last year stating that this money can be brought in as remittances. It's, so remittances are not like exports, but freelancers and working for the, the US or for Europe, that is practically export. So we allowed them to treat export like remittances so that uh, the cost would fall. So we should be seeing some development in, in this area, the freelancers area this year. Two, what, uh, what we are engaged with the, with, with the financial sector is that we have also allowed the freelancers and the exporters of softwares to, to retain 35% of their foreign exchange with them so that they can use it for marketing and selling their products. So that is allowed and that is exceptional. No other exporter is allowed 35% of dollar retention. And remember why, why uh, Pakistan is a country that does not have enough foreign exchange. And that's why you hear every, every day about State Bank of Pakistan's foreign exchange reserves and that is why you need, you need to borrow. The third aspect the, what we are currently working on is uh, with, with the banks is to make these freelancers bankable so that a credit or at least an operational history is developed. And that would mean that, that a particular bank would be opening with these accounts in an environment of uh, compliance or high KYC, they would be subjected to moderately lesser KYC so that they, they are in, enabled and they are facilitated to open their accounts and what this would do is that they would become one bank and two, they, they would be able to utilize the banking services of loans, credit cards and other things. Now go, going forward, I think what this is what state bank can do, we can engage with the banks, we can facilitate payments and uh, we can incentivize institutions to lend to these these guys so that they are able to you know develop their technological base get some more education and add value to the products that they are selling now what we can't do as, as a central bank is that we, we we cannot harness that energy for that the government and and the private sector will have to join hand pakistan software export board will have to put in more energy that the it firms or the prospective IT investors we will need to use and harness that energy to export more so as to get more and more money back into Pakistan. I've met a, a number of freelancers of the, over the past uh, year and, uh, I, and I find them to be young and, and I find them to be energetic and I find them to be delivering. So that, that's, that's the positive part. Uh, the negative part is that uh, they, they tend to retain money abroad in the US especially, which, which, which is uh, the, the primary uh, target for, for a lot of free, freelancers and there are local firms in the US that helps them keep money abroad, which is against the interests of Pakistan and we like that, that money back into Pakistan. So challenges remain yeah. and uh, I think State Bank would, would do whatever is needed. So what we will primarily make payments as much easier as possible thank you and less costly as well thank you so far but i would like to uh, either present Paksha as well and uh, PSAP 
So I just want to give you my view, the practical view that what happens. It's nothing uh, specific uh, on State Bank, but what what you just said that we we have a huge difficulty in Pakistan for IT outsourcing companies to send money outside of Pakistan because the problem is uh, which state bank and the government needs to understand when uh, you are investing and in opening an IT company you have to hire say for example if I'm setting up in uh, Europe right I need at least few million dollars initially to send from my remittance outside to hire people locally here set up the offices and then after a few years we will start receiving the money right what just uh, he highlighted that we initially like we set up uh, our u.s office 20 years ago we were in loss for a few years and then we have remitted like i would say hundreds of millions of dollars back to pakistan but initial hurdle is too high cost that people avoid using state bank channel because it's not going to happen. It takes months and months of inefficiencies in the system to send money outside. You can't operate if it, and what you just said, 35% retention, as I said, like we remit every month millions of dollars, right? But this 35% sending back is a pain. It doesn't work that way because state bank asks the invoices to submit why you are sending back that money, which commission, and then if you want to do a right business in the right frame of mind, it doesn't work because then you have to show all the wrong stuff to send your money back which the state <laughs> bank allows. Actually, the it's, banks actually encourage you to break the law. Let me just put it this way. I mean, because it is so much the real process is so complicated. For instance, we set up in Saudi and in and, and Qatar and all. For us to be in, now in Arabic speaking countries, uh, and you know, when the, uh, now we have a delegation from Saudi as well, and a lot of trade is going to happen. Now, we, ha if, if you're going to work in Arab countries, you have to have Arab speaking consultants and Arab speaking salespersons. You cannot do a business otherwise. And, and if then you need a joint venture with one of their local companies. Now, in that case, you have to give them money. Now, there is no legal channel to give them money. The only way to do it is whatever little profits we have from abroad, you keep them outside <laughs> so you can pay from Dubai or something else. Okay. So, bringing in money, is, is it's such a take, and it is really hurting our export. Now, if our companies are big enough to be global players, no, we okay. cannot be global players unless we are part of the financial cycle, a uh, 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 global financial cycle, which we are not at the moment. Let's we quickly have Irfan uh, Saab's view. So I that's think, you. Uh, <laughs> you, you have my sympathies. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, we need more than that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you certainly have my, have my sympathies. And uh, yeah, I, 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 I wish I could uh, make such a commitment uh, sitting at this forum, but let let's look at it in, in, in the in the in the right context. Here's a country that uh, is uh, not exporting what it has to, and uh, and then we import sixty billion dollars plus, you know, so that that leaves a huge gap of about sixty minus you know twenty billion of export leaves us with forty billion dollars negative. And then we are left with the Pakistanis come in and they send about $20 billion. So that, that leaves us with $20 billion negative. And then, you know, you have a couple of billion dollars of foreign investment and things like that. So here as a country that the day I, every day I, you know, I, I shudder at the thought of, you know, the payments that, that are to be made. And here we are a, a deficit sitting at a deficit almost almost on a, on a daily basis. So whatever actions state bank and the banking industry takes is in that context. Now you have to decide, I mean, we are making a decision, Pakistani, we are making a decision that we have to play our own. We have to McDonald's, is that our investment is Mac, Do we need McDonald's investments? Excuse me if I sound emotional, but. Is that the kind of investment we need? Burgers, Burger Kings, <laughs> Pakistan. If, if that is what you need, if, you, if Hardee's, or Burger Kings and McDonald's, you know, excuse me, then you are paying for fries. You, you, are fry, you are paying for chicken patties. You are 
paying for onion rings. In fact, I was, I, was, I mean, I, I was in Lahore last month for, for a couple of days and walking, you know, I, I had a walk yep. along Fortress Stadium and there was a big ad stating that we are importing fries. Fries import ka ad laga. So the point is that if you as a nation and <laughs> we as a nation decide to be an import based economy, consumer so we are, what are we doing? We are encouraging consumer, consumerism and excuse me sir, there will be nothing left for you. Yes. You will be able to send no money abroad, you will be able to send no money to hire your professionals Sorry. and you will find ways and means abroad. That is why a lot of Pakistanis retain their money abroad because yes, they are right. When they bring it back to Pakistan, they are unable to take it. Or So what do we do? So we create a sort of a rationing exercise and we place people in the queue and that is why you have to win. Now, this is a choice or a decision that we will have to take as Pakistan. We don't deserve what we, we don't deserve Prados, we don't deserve Audis, we don't Maybe. deserve a lot of things that, that we buy. Excuse me, all of it was our present Nawaz Shri Mi Kagya. Now, Usse Pehle Ke Kumar Khai, Now, Aaj Ke Kumar Khari. Ye Sare Paise Hum Log Khare. We are the people. Hum Log McDonald's Khate, Hum Log Burger King Khate, Hum Log Audis Chilate, Hum Log Imported Patrol Istamal Karte. That is why. So, we have to decide, you know, the government Kya Karte. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we're running out of time, and uh, so what I'll suggest is that before uh, uh, I go to the floor and pick up any questions, just one question across the whole panel, and just a quick uh, answer to that. What one recommendation would you like to give it to the government? If, if each of the panel can, uh, can respond to that quickly, then we can move on to the panel, uh, to the floor to pick up questions. Just very quick. Yeah, I would just... Uh, Key outsourcing perspective. Yeah. I think we have to build our brand and uh, we have to give the message and the narrative to uh, all the people, ambassadors and our prime ministers and uh, whenever they go, they highlight the IT as an outsourcing hub for Pakistan okay. and demand will only generate when we sell Pakistan, when sure. we brand Pakistan, okay. we market Pakistan, we believe in Pakistan. Thank you. Uh, we... uh, from operating company perspective, I think uh, uh, one simple suggestion could be yes, KF. Th these things will come. These yeah. have been there. They will be coming. They'll, they will be coming in a much furious way, much lethal way. <laughs> so, and uh, instead of actually having a debate on them, it's much better to actually embrace them and try to get good out of them and try to use them. And as we use them, it will automatically mature and try to make them in our favor. Thank you. Awesome. I think uh, there is a great future for, for outsourcing uh, and I think that happens locally which will develop the local uh, outsourcing industry which will then attract uh, you know, foreign outsourcing as well. At our organization for instance, uh, you know, a few years back EY set up uh, a company called Rapid Innovation which actually does data analytics since the data back uh, cleansed and uh, analyzed to the Middle East office and uh, you know they, they brought efficiency into their process. You know that number has gone up by 40 uh, by almost four times yeah. this year and you know they'll keep on increasing. So uh, similarly our clients are outsourcing greater amount of uh, their non-core functions to us and their international operations are also looking at that and, and, and uh, beginning outsourcing. So I think the, the opportunity uh, given the talent and the potential for youth over here is tremendous. What we need to do is invest in their training and development, invest in technology. And I think the kind of competition uh, and, and you know the level of sophistication that China and the US are going through, uh, there is a lot of investment that would need to be made in order to develop people that can adapt to the changes globally and be competitive uh, at a global level yep. in years to come. And you know, despite you know, the limitations we have as an economy, we would need support from regulators like uh, the central bank from SCCP 
to enable these uh, investments to come in, which may be in the form of you know, remittances for the uh, consultants and experts that we need to for the initial setup, and then develop the skill sets that we need to uh, you you. Know, offer to the rest of the world. Uh, I think, uh, in, in my view, we'll have to spend more money and time on, on value addition. Thank you. I think it, it's, it's we, I think we should have had enough of plain vanilla products being sold abroad, including technology. I think if, if we can, you know, do that, I think uh, we, we will be able to serve this country better. Thank you. Hina? Uh, my takeaway today would be uh, to, in, to, write, to strike the right balance between human capital and technology. Uh, I think we need to rethink the way we deploy our human capital. Uh, with the right amount of training, I think we can uh, delegate the lesser jobs to, uh, to the AI and to the robotics, etc., and keep our human capital for jobs which cannot be replaced by AI, and then uh, develop that human resource in a way that they can represent Pakistan abroad also. Thank you. So, uh, I believe we need to create niches uh, area within the outsourcing spectrum where we are the go-to place. For instance, uh, we can pick anything like Microsoft or SAP or Oracle or whatever, or AI or blockchain, yeah. and we need to become the go-to place for that. So if somebody thinks of getting an SAP consultant for that matter, then Pakistan should automatically come. So I think we need to be develop niches and then expand within that niche. That's how we need to start, and then we can go horizontally across various niches. Thanks, Sajjah. We move on to the floor now and pick up any questions. Uh, audience among the <coughs> mic, please, for them. Uh, my name is Ilyas Beg, and I'm with OrthoLaurus. We are a BPO company in, uh, based in Karachi for the last 10 years. And I was surprised to see the result of a uh, question about the regulatory authorities uh, doing enough in Pakistan. I think there's a strong need. My, I don't have a question, I have a comment. With the experience of past 10 years, there's a strong need that we, the companies who are offering the outsourcing services or BPO services or offshoring should sit with the regulators, be it in the state bank, be it in PTCL, be it in revenue authorities, and let them understand what we do and what are the potentials. I think Pakistan has great potential, and the initiative that ACC has taken about making Pakistan the preferred destination of shared services, we can be as close to Philippines uh, within the next four to five years if our government regulatory authorities make it easy for us to do the business. Thank you. Any questions? So I have two questions, uh, both of them for uh, Irfan sir. Uh, so you just mentioned <laughs> Too that many questions for Irfan sir. <laughs> uh, so you uh, mentioned that uh, uh, Pakistan is an import, importing nation, obviously. So uh, we tend to import a lot of food and other products as well. But uh, as you may very well know that we obviously import a lot of uh, oil, uh, we import a lot of oil products as well. So about one third of our import bill comes from uh, comes basically from oil products. So uh, it, maybe you just simplified it. I think uh, it was uh, you know a bit unfair uh, when it comes to businesses. Obviously, these IT firms are uh, facing problems in terms of expanding their operations in Pakistan just because of payment constraints. So, um, uh, do you think that it's a fair uh, thing to, uh, you know, simplify uh, all the problems into saying that Pakistanis maybe eat a lot of McDonald's or Big Macs? So, uh, obviously, we have other things coming as well. In the, um, uh, so, so, since we are going into CPEC as well, we are importing a lot of machinery. Um, oil prices are very volatile; they keep going up and down. So, that also imports our balance. That also disturbs our balance of payment. So, uh, uh, what are what is State Bank doing specifically to help these IT firms? Uh, enable, uh, you know, uh, to go, to help them grow or solve their problems. So that's my first first question. One, I, uh, I, I certainly do not uh, disagree with, with your comments to begin with, and uh, it, it was just a, a larger picture that I portrayed before you as to why uh, payments cannot be made efficiently. Though. So there was a reason behind that. 
Now, like I said, uh, State Bank has directed the financial institutions to engage with freelancers to, to enable them to be banked and to facilitate payments. So that, that is what State Bank of Pakistan is doing at the moment. And uh, you can also retain a percentage of your, of your foreign exchange for advertising, promotion, etc. A lot of things kindly understand that they are beyond the domain of State Bank of Pakistan. That's something then, that is something you should be doing. And then there are other bodies who are also, you know, working for, for, for freelancers or IT firms. For example, the Ministry of Technology, for example, what are they doing? Pakistan Software Export Board, what are they doing? Pasha, what are they doing? And then have they ever come to State Bank of Pakistan? For, for their problems, no. So that, that is the ground reality. So we, we, we need to work uh, very, very hard together. And uh, if we are able to do that, I'm sure a lot of these problems would be addressed. Excuse me, uh, I'm a regulator, so I, I tend to be direct and I don't mince words when I speak. Thank, thank you, thank you, Rupan sir. Uh, one last question from the floor before we go to Slido. My name is Kazi Abdul Muktadil. <coughs> former Deputy Governor of the State Bank. So I'm not here to, what Irfan has mentioned has been the thinking for many, many years. And I think <clears throat> Pakistan, Pakistanis are multitaskers. And we as a nation have to look into of how we are going to forge ahead. We need to enable our people to be able to export our services. Now you can export services by putting the manpower outside and asking him to remit money back into Pakistan or you're going to send out some goods or services out of Pakistan which includes accounting. Now how many accounting firms from Pakistan are exporting the services? I mean looking at from that point of view if you look at it rather we we normally want some foreign accounting company to come and do our work and provide us consultancies. Now is that the way to go about it? I don't think so and at the same time our people are very good. If we can train them, if we can bring them up, up like what our friend over here from, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Sajjad Sahib had mentioned, very good ideas similar from Pir Sayyid. We need to put these into place and we need to look at it strategically and go about it. The policies that are there, the state bank and other regulatory agencies are not there to impose something, they're there to help you. And I think they, they would be more than happy. And in the past, a lot of things have been done to ease the, ease the payments. Now, a lot of questions do come in on the payment side is, why don't we get PayPal into Pakistan? I mean, it's not getting PayPal into Pakistan. PayPal itself does not want to come to Pakistan. They have their own priorities. Now, why don't we develop our own payment system in Pakistan? We've tried, we, and State Bank has tried to help out PayPal, develop PayPal in Pakistan. And I've been approached recently by people, how can we enable it? You see, every you see card transaction that you do, you are paying out to Visa and MasterCard. There's a small amount that is pay, paid out. Why do we need to pay out? With all the minds that we have over here, why can we not have our own payment system that operates within Pakistan in Pak rupee basis? We've tried to do that such a payment system for the whole SAC countries, but we failed to do it because we were not able to do it. So we you. need to get into those areas and the banking has to help them out. The insurance has to help them out. Yeah. The, the SECP has to come about with it. Similarly, what Irfan mentioned out, that the PASHA, the software house, development uh, mm -hmm. programs, etc. They need to come up and say, what are the difficulties that they face? The impediments that are there, they could be removed. Thank you. Thank you for you. Great. Uh, thank you for the comments. Sir. So um, for the webinar attendees and on Slido, we have a couple of questions and I'll open the floor and uh, we'll have a quick comment on that. So there's one question that Umar Farooq Azim is asking that outsourcing has its own pitfalls as well. Uh, it's easy to be replicated by competition and uh, it leads to disruption of the supply chain by allowing new competitors into the industry and also it undermines a company's relations with its employers and customers. Um, his question is, how can companies strike the right balance between profitability and a healthy relationship with employees, customers, and society at large? 
So either of you can answer, absolutely. <laughs> There's no right answer uh, to this. Obviously, every company has to look at it in its own domain, but I, I believe that uh, uh, normally you outsource uh, manufacturing concerns, and I think question relates to that, is non-core operations. And if they improve efficiency and improve quality, then invariably the customers should be happy because they have a better quality product. Now, in terms of employees, outsourcing has to be done very strategically. Uh, certain, of course, jobs would be eliminated. Uh, I've had customers who've come to us and said, we're going to outsource A, B, C, and D and kindly hire those people. We recently had a customer in Pakistan, very large, uh, one of the largest companies, they outsource their, uh, as part of their outsourcing agreement, we were supposed to offer jobs to their employees. So again, it is not, if you are outsourcing based, or if our value proposition is that we are cheaper, then of course those employees have to be let go, because your cost has to be lesser than them. But if it is quality, then it's a totally different ball game. And, and that is why when companies outsource, they should be looking at, they should not just be looking at reducing costs, they should also be looking at certain improvement in service delivery. Right. And, and that's when the relationship would come. Great. And the final question, uh, I want to give this to the Slido attendees because we have been taking a lot of polls as well, um, is that how much do you think is feasible in Pakistan to outsource a business consultancy anywhere in the world? So I no, think so, they're yeah, talking in terms outside. of uh, how much is it in terms of your return on investment? I, I think it's difficult also, to outsource uh, because you can't pay them. I mean, I think that's, that's a fundamental problem that I think we've been talking about. Uh, making a remittance for services that you want to bring into Pakistan is a major challenge. Um, so uh, unless you have, you know, uh, you know, very, a lot of patience with your uh, we, service providers. That we, we outsource some work, uh, some very specialized mm -hmm. skills, where the skill set doesn't exist in Pakistan. Uh, we do outsource to Singapore and to North America as well, uh, certain very niche areas or uh, where we are trying to train our people or in, 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 get our people enabled. Uh, it is difficult to pay, there is no doubt. Yeah. Uh, so that's one challenge because invariably the company that deals with you once after the contract is over, they don't want to deal yeah. with you because you can never pay them on time. Also, uh, you want to add something to it? I think I would like to say that uh, to create a scale, uh, you definitely need some expertise and uh, whether it's uh, remote or firm, but uh, you engage consultant, but goal should be that how do we learn from that consultant and have a multiplier effect and be create our own talent to replace them in the future, right? That's a key because uh, once you create that wedge, then you are going to be creating a differentiator for others. So initially you might have to, but it will be very minimal because we have the people who can take up those learnings and apply that uh, in a multiple places. So uh, IT consulting is important and we can outsource a lot of consultant abroad as well because as I said, we have the right mix of the talent. We might not have the quantity, but we have a very good quality which can compete in Europe, America. I have been doing this for 20 years. We compete with large Indian uh, companies as well. Uh, and it's not just, as uh, Sajjad said, on a price, it's price as well as quality. And both things matter. If you can say that, that uh, I just slightly disagree that our quality is better and we can charge premium in Pakistan, you can't. Your price is one factor in your strategy roadmap that will give you volume. And right now we should take an advantage of this currency devaluation, I think people are ignoring that, but you have to price it accordingly to be very competitive in global uh, arena and be more competitive and scale. Right now, Pakistan needs volume and scale rather than anything else. Great, fantastic. I think that's a very positive note um, uh, to end the panel discussion. Thank you so much to the panelists.